blindness is not the end of the world. You are not a useless object. You are a person and we are proud of you. Stick your neck out. The weekly podcast of the Giraffe Heroes Foundation. Welcome to the podcast to restore your faith in humanity. Welcome to Stick Your Neck Out. I am Jampira Gyardurañona and my guest today is Tiffany Brar. She's an Indian community service worker who has been blind since childhood. A social activist and trainer working to create awareness on disability. She is the founder of the Yotigamaya Foundation, a non-profit organization whose stated mission is to help blind people in all spheres of life to gain the skills needed for a successful and smooth existence. Tiffany, could you please tell me what comes to your mind when you hear the words independence for the blind? Independence for the blind means that everything should be accessible for blind people. Blind people should not be treated as objects of charity. It often happens in many countries that blind people are treated as dependents or as objects of charity. They are treated with, oh, you poor blind person, how can you work, how can you walk? But if the environment is accessible, for instance, proper footpaths, proper roads to walk, braille signages wherever needed, signals for crossing roads, volunteers wherever necessary, who do not think that helping the blind is a kind of charity, but who consider it as something part of normal life, where everything, every service is accessible for the blind, where they can be breadwinners, they can earn their own money, contribute to the society. That is what I mean by independence for blind. At some point in your life, you started a mobile blind school. Why? And what is exactly a mobile blind school? A mobile blind school means reaching out to the blind people in their homes, where they are tucked away in the rural areas, where their parents or guardians cannot bring them to other organizations which exist in the urban areas due to poverty, distance, also ignorance. A lot of parents are still of the opinion that Oh, she's blind, he's blind. Why should I spend my money and take him to this organization or to that organization? Is he going to earn? Is he going to make a living? There are many people that have that notion. And that's why we have to go to their homes in the rural areas, reach out to them, give counseling to their guardians, and then train them in basic skills. There are many blind people in the urban areas also whose parents are ashamed of their disabilities and who keep them hidden away in locked doors, in rooms, who don't bring them out. We have to reach out to them as well. So when I say a mobile blind school, I mean reaching out, going to them where they do not have to come to the organization, but the school goes to them. That is what I mean by a mobile blind school, where we travel and impart training to blind people who cannot reach organizations. And that's a beautiful idea, which leads me to my next question. Your slogan is an eye to the blind. What do you have in mind when you created this slogan? When I say an eye to the blind, Jodhar Gamea is an eye to the blind. I don't mean that we are magic workers or magicians or God who can give them eyes. But what I mean is we can enable them to see through their inner eyes, through technology, through mobility, through accessibility, through independent living. They can see the world through their inner eyes. We empower the blind people to think for themselves, to travel independently, to use technology so that they can get in touch with the outside world, to use social media, to use the internet. And that itself is their independence. They are seeing from their inner eyes because they are able to do all these activities just as sighted people do. That is what I mean by an eye to the blind, where we are enabling them to see through their inner eyes. According to some Indian statistics, this country is the home of almost 15 million blind people. Only a minority of them have access to a good education. This is due to poverty, ignorance and distance. They lack in orientation and mobility skills and are not able to perform some activities of daily living. Your organization is, among other things, empowering the blind in skills they needed. Which skills are we talking about exactly? And 
How do you do that? When I talk about skills, I mean the blind people come to our organization and we train them and empower them in the necessary skills they need to live a successful and dignified life. Now, what skills do we teach? We train them in the use of a white cane, orientation and mobility, indoor and outdoor, traveling in public transport, identification of currency, how to count their money, go to shops, travel in public transport. We teach them how to communicate, how to speak English, basic English for employment. We train them in access technology, which comprises of both basic and advanced computer training, which ranges from familiarization of the keyboard to notepad to MS Word to Excel to PowerPoint to internet to installation of software, handling of social media, sending emails, using various email clients, and so on and so forth. We also train them in the use of iPhones and Android phones so that they can be up to date with their social media, chat in WhatsApp, send Instagram messages, use Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and a lot more. They can also use banking applications, travel-related applications, order food, and do a lot more. There are yet a lot of apps that are still not completely accessible for the blind, but yes, I'm sure they will become accessible and we will be training them in those skills too. We've just started a vocational training center where we train blind people in making candles, making liquid, lotion, soap, and uh, now we are also training them in making small bags. So we train our students in vocational skills, IT skills, communication, orientation, mobility, and adaptive physical education. Orientation and mobility is a vital aspect in the life of every individual with visual impairment. It is one of the major aspects which enable them to live a successful, productive and free life. Now, once you are a baby, you kind of learn how to move, how to walk almost by yourself. You see the floor where you might fall, you see the walls where you might hold on to. How do you teach a blind person mobility and orientation? As you've just said, yes, orientation and mobility is a very, very, very vital process for everyone. Especially, yes, when we are babies, we learn how to uh, crawl and walk and touch things and see things, of course. And a lot of sighted babies or sighted kids learn through imitation, learn by seeing the other person, learn by seeing the other person walking, seeing how they are walking, seeing that they are asking you, okay, look at that wall there, don't fall. Look at the bar there, don't fall. In a blind person's case, it's tactile, it's touch. The blind babies are shown not to touch this wall or not to touch that bar or not to do certain things. So these are the kind of skills that blind people are learning. Uh, they are taught indoor mobility and outdoor mobility. Indoor mobility means that they are taught what is in the house through upper body and lower body protection. For example, there are walls there, there are cupboards there, there are bars there. The parents show the blind people these things. We have to feel these things, where these things are, what is actually going on, where can we fall, where will we bump ourselves. It's a very, very difficult process, but as long as the child then understands, we also train them in the rough surface of the road, the smooth surface, that is with the help of the white cane. That is when they're slightly older, they learn the use of the white cane, the two-point touch, how to touch the white cane on the road and on the grassy or sandy surface of the road where cars do not come or where pedestrians walk. In other countries, it's often called the pavement because it's free of all kinds of obstacles and only pedestrians can walk on it. But here in India, we call this the shoreline because it's the end of the road. It's either a sandy surface or a grassy surface. And the concrete surface is the road where the actual vehicles are driving. So we often train our students in the two-point touch using the white cane. So they touch or tap their canes alternatively on both rough and smooth surfaces so that they know which side they can touch and which side uh, the cars are coming and they have a rough orientation. So they are taught to walk either on the left shoreline or on the right shoreline, their cane tapping alternatively on the road and on the grassy, uh, on the grassy and sandy path. So uh, this is how we tr teach orientation mobility. There is a process called trailing, trailing with the back of the hands. So you trail a wall with the back of your hands because the front of your hands is very sensitive to poking sharp objects and things like that. So we often teach trailing using the back of a hand. Uh, the blind people are often taught to follow a wall 
uh, by using this trailing technique and also the upper body and the lower body protection technique. The lower body protection is to protect their lower body from uh, coming into contact or harm with other obstacles like low tables, low chairs and uh, things that are kept at the waist height or even lower than that. And the upper body protection is to protect the person from objects or people or posts at head height. So this is what I mean by teaching these processes of both indoor and outdoor orientation and mobility. That's awesome. And I think the kids are quick learners, but I'm guessing for the family it's not an easy process. Naturally, in many families, especially who are in low economic conditions or who are frustrated due to many other reasons, if a child is born blind and if they have other talents like, suppose, uh, a cricket playing or singing or even dancing or many, many other kind of talents, even fire juggling, there are many things that blind people can do. But often in many cases, especially in developing countries and in economically uh, low income families, they do focus on the disability because they think that, okay, this child is useless. He can't do this. He can't do that. And even if he has this talent, I'm going to have to invest all my money. I'm going to have to take him there. I'm going to have to take him here. I'm going to have to give him this class. He can't travel alone. I can't send him alone, even if he has to attend a class. So, you know, it's very, very difficult for a blind person to pursue his or her talent, especially in countries like India. It's a uh, often the case where they focus more on the blindness. We have to fight this by enabling and empowering the blind person to first be independent, to first find their voice, to first build confidence in themselves and to be able to pursue this talent. Now, there are many blind people who are piano players, who are experts in doing things, but then, of course, they need their parents or guardians to take them to or from. If they have to go for a performance, they need someone to take them. If they have to come back, they need someone to bring them back. But that's why some parents, if they get money, they're like, okay, okay, we'll take you here, we'll take you there. But some people are like, okay, why? Why should I waste my time and waste my money? But if he or she is independent or is given the skills to become independent, he or she can actually say, okay, mom, okay, dad, I'm going for this performance and they can go and come back freely. So this has to uh, come. And also the blind person has to know how to uh, be confident, has to know how to raise his voice, has to know how to travel independently, and also has to have supportive guardians or also has to make his parents or guardians believe in his talent. This is really, really important. You have to make them believe in your talent by being independent, by being empowered, by not sitting there like a dummy and saying, okay, okay, if you say I'll do this, if you don't say I won't do that, or okay, I will give up my talent because my parents cannot drop me to A and B class or um, they cannot support me. Now, I have a student who I met at the age of 10. Uh, her name is Hannah. And when she, I first met her, she was very, very shy and timid. She had a lovely singing voice, but she was often... Uh, trampled on because she was teased by her classmates for being blind, for the way she looked, for her eyes, for a lot of things. And her parents, however, were very supportive. But at the same time, they were very concerned about her. They were like, okay, what is my daughter going to do? How is she going to do these things? How, um, how is she going to do that? Then we at our camp taught her orientation mobility. We taught her the basics of computers. And now uh, she knows how to download her own books, how to do her own assignments, how to use the internet, uh, how to handle YouTube and uh, how to send emails. And also she has her own YouTube channel. She composes songs. Of course, she has a lot of support from her parents. She does not travel alone yet, but I believe that she will conquer that challenge as well and she will be traveling alone in a few years time. So she is actually... Um, got good parents who were, were convinced about her talent and who believed in her and who wanted to go uh, ahead, who wanted her to go ahead. So uh, there are many people like that and there are many people who are not, but we have to change their attitude by changing our attitude. Well, that sounds great. It happens that people are so obsessed with their blindness that they tend to believe that life has come to a standstill if the person has no sight or has lost a vision. The focus tends to entirely be on the blindness and whatever talent or ability the person possesses is totally undermined. Tiffany, how can we fight this? There are three models of disability. The charity model, the social model and the medical model. 
in India and in many other countries, as you said, we follow the charity model. Like, okay, disabled people or blind people are objects of charity. They are like, oh, you poor blind person. Whenever I cross the road, people still, even though I've been walking on these roads for the past seven to eight years or maybe more, I think around 10 years now, and I'm still being treated with the same attitude I was 10 years ago by some people. Some people, however, have an attitudinal change. So it depends on the way you think. It also depends on the environment. Many people still treat us as objects of sympathy. Now we need to really change that by proving what we can do, by coming out. If people with disabilities come out, raise their voices, make some change in their lives, like get jobs, by their own effort and merit, not only by the effort and merit of the government or of other people or on sympathetical grounds, but on their own merit grounds. And also if they travel independently, like just imagine I'm going for an interview. I have all the speaking skills in the world, but I'm being dragged by my mother or I'm just holding my mother's hand. My head is completely down and I'm answering the questions in a whimpering soft voice and I'm not confident. And I'm again, straight after the interview, my mother comes and hold, holds my hand and takes me out again. So that will create sympathy. The person who's going to give me a job is going to say, oh, that poor blind girl, what to do? But if I walk in with my head up, with my white cane, and speak in a clear, confident voice without any falter, and I find my way and I leave the building the same way I came with my white cane, and I travel by bus or by car or by taxi, if I'm able to book the taxi, if I'm able to use my phone, if I'm able to navigate the building with my white cane and with minimum assistance, I'm sure the attitude of my employer will change. He's going to be like, okay, she knows what she's doing. So we have to become those objects of change and we have to bring people to treat us in the social model as normal human beings and not as objects of charity. Yes, we need indeed more of this attitude. Blind people and people with visual impairment are usually treated with pity and charity in India, and I think in a lot of places around the world. Their ability and potential are not fully recognized. Often, the focus is on their limitations, not on the possibilities available and the assets you can also gain. Consequently, they are often marginalized, ill-informed and not stimulated to explore their potential. How do you build confidence in blind people, Tiffany? And how you transform this sympathy into empathy. When I was young, I was always protected and chaperoned. I could not even travel a step unaided. It was first my parents and then my helpers and caregivers and uh, my teachers in school and my classmates. And I was like continuously being taken around from one class to another, from one room to another. In fact, I couldn't even dress myself till very late in life. But after I met certain people in my life, certain caregivers who taught me how to dress myself, how to look smart, how to actually be proud of my clothes and my hair and my appearance, or for instance, how important it was to polish my shoes. Even when I got my first job, which was at Kantari, Braille Without Borders, as a receptionist, the first blow was that I had to travel 15 kilometers from my place of residence. First, my father says, nothing doing, you're not doing it. We're going to ask someone to travel with you every day, or we're going to keep something, or we're going to keep a driver, or this or that. And I said, I'm not doing it. I'm going to travel alone. And I started by traveling from the Kantari campus to my college by myself. I had to change three or four buses. I even got lost, but that gave me a sense of victory. I then further went to gain my mobility training in uh, the Bangalore National Association for the Blind, and I went to do my special education in the state of Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore. And I learned the techniques of orientation mobility, how to actually travel and how to actually empower others and train others. And uh, then I started the mobile blind school, and then, of course, uh, um, I started the Jyotirgamaya Foundation as an official uh, registered char- charitable trust and also the training center. And then now I realize that there is a big difference in what I was then and what I am now. I saw many, many blind people. I saw blind people like Habria was uh, the first blind woman who I saw who was like completely empowered. And then I saw... Uh, A lot of other blind people uh, like uh, Jessica Schroeder from Germany 
and also a lot of blind people from Africa and a lot of other blind people from various countries. My roommate was a blind lady from Kenya. And I learned, I learned many things from different persons from the world and how their attitude is. I even saw other Indian blind people who were also taking life into their own hands and uh, who had uh, the skills. And I was like, okay, if all of them can, then why can't I? Yeah. So Tiffany, if I become blind and I go to your center to learn to live this new life situation for me, how can you teach me? What should I expect? Let's say, how do you teach me, for example, to read and to write? to move around? Well, <laughs> that's a really, really tough question. If I were to imagine you in the place of one of my students, uh, if you became blind, yes, and you did come actually to my training center to learn, I would first give you the confidence that blindness is not the end of the world. You are not a useless object. You are a person and we are proud of you. I would first give you that confidence, the therapy that you needed, the counseling, the guidance. And if you were all confident and you just needed to know skills, I would first train you how to do your basic activities like taking your plate or maybe uh, trying to, um, how would you basically uh, have your food or uh, Because there are many blind people who became blind later in life and, you know, they need to learn all these skills from the scratch. But I would assess your level. How confident are you? What daily activities can you perform yourself? And then I would basically come to the plus curricular skills, like train you in reading Braille if you wanted to learn Braille, how to read Braille, how to write Braille, how to use a Brailler or a slate and stylus. Then if you uh, wanted to learn about technology, I would train you in the use of a computer from the keyboard until the use of the internet. I would also train you how to use a smartphone, how to dial numbers, how to make phone calls, for instance, how to use the basic applications, how to read audiobooks, and those kind of things. But I would first start with the confidence building. I would then start with the orientation, mobility, and the daily living skills. And only then, only then, after you are fully confident and after your early intervention, I would then start with the other plus curricular skills meaning the Braille, the computers, the other access technology and how to handle software. And then slowly, slowly, we would go to adventures, going out, doing uh, fun activities like uh, yoga and sports and traveling around and walking and trekking and even swimming and all the other things that I teach my students. And your students are lucky to have you. Um, Tiffany, if you agree, I'd like to talk about your personal situation a little. How was it at your home when you grew up? What was your biggest challenge? I was born into a multicultural army family where all my relatives were in the army. My father, my grandfather, my uncle, everyone. So naturally they must have thought that, okay, even I should uh, be in the army. But I was, uh, I became blind uh, due to a premature birth and uh, some complications in the lungs, which led to an overdose of oxygen. My parents took me to many countries and uh, to many places and tried to heal my blindness. But I think that I became blind for a purpose. And that's why God wanted me to be the way I am, so that I can be a voice for other blind people. And I think it was God's plan for me. That's what I really, really think. And I'm happy and I'm proud to be blind. I'm really, really proud to be blind. But my situation, coming back to my childhood, was really, really Uh, challenging. Of course, because I came from a good home, I uh, had English-speaking parents, but my school education was really challenging. I went to school uh, in England first because my father had a foreign posting, and there, of course, we had support assistance, and we were taught that these kind of things were our rights to have a special teacher, to have certain braille devices and things like that. But when I came back here to India, to my own home country, and came to Kerala, I came to a school where there were only sighted people because my parents refused to put me in a blind school. They were like, oh, the blind school's conditions are bad and poor, and, you know, I do, we don't want our daughter there, and, you know, we don't want her mixing with people from lower income backgrounds and things like that. But when I went to a sided school, I was ostracized. I was made to sit at the back bench. I was made to sharpen other children's pencils. I was made to play with clay and plasticine. And I was not even acknowledged. Even when I stood up to give an answer, 
which was right, of course. I was told by the teacher to sit down. I was reprimanded. I was said, how dare you answer this question? You're blind. Let your classmate do it. You have no right to answer a question. I was thrown out of the class for actually giving the right answer. And I was accused of conning my classmate in giving the wrong answer. I mean, I gave the right answer and my classmate actually, she didn't study, so she gave the wrong answer. And I was told that you purposefully made her give the wrong answer so that you can be in the right and you're blind and you don't know and you're cheating and things like that. So my school education was difficult. Also, when I was uh, in my high school, I never got Braille notes and materials. I either got my Braille notes and materials after the examination or just one day before the examination. At home, of course, I was not allowed to do things myself until very late in life. I lost my mother at young age of 12. My father went to the borders in order to fight the 1999 Kargil War. But yeah, but he could not help it because uh, those were his orders and he had to do it. And I was left in hostels. Then I was left with some caregivers. And one caregiver, a lady, was really strong with me and treated me like a daughter and taught me um, how to do my daily living activities and taught me that, you know, I could do certain things by myself and I could learn if I wanted to learn, I could comb my hair, I could have a bath, I could dress myself. And she gave me some confidence. And then, of course, I gained my confidence from a few good friends, from teachers, from well-wishers. And of course, when I got my first job and then when I went into the field of special education and activism, of course, my confidence came slowly. But as a child, it was very, very challenging, especially being a girl, not being allowed to travel alone, uh, not, not being allowed to do a lot of things, not being also to come from a high family, being overprotected and over uh, cared for, you know. So there are two uh, things like either blind people are really neglected if they are from really poor backgrounds or if they are from extremely high backgrounds, they are over, over cared for. So that was what happened with me in my childhood. And that was how my personal situation was. And these are my challenges. Difficult, but somehow you overcome them. You know, listening to everything you said and the way you, you have lived, I, I really need to ask you this. How do we manage that blindness rather becomes an asset, not a liability? Blindness can be an asset if we as blind people make it an asset. That is what I've been trying to explain to every blind person. But what we do is we demand for our rights and we're like, we have to get this and we have to get that. But what are we doing for it? Why are we waiting for the government, waiting for someone else? We have to actually go out there, raise our voice, go and talk to the government, uh, stand in protest for our rights if they are not being uh, confirmed formed upon us, work for it, produce orders and circulars and whatever is needed, produce the law, learn the law, learn about the rights and about things like that. What else do we have to do is work for our living to become assets. We cannot just become assets. We have to be assets to the community by fighting for our rights. And we have to be assets to our own families by going out and working and earning money and becoming taxpayers and not liabilities. You know, becoming assets by earning and bringing home and supporting others, helping others, contributing. That's how blindness can become an asset because we know how to handle it. We know we use our assistive devices. We use our brains. We use our white canes. You use your white canes, but you also have a lot. I mean, all of us have a lot of new technologies that we can use to improve our life. What are the latest technologies or kind of breakthroughs regarding accessibility? The latest technologies and breakthroughs in accessibility, uh, the screen readers that blind people use are uh, JAWS, Job Access with Speech in Windows. Uh, this screen reader allows you to use the computer freely and smoothly, but it's highly expensive. It needs a license. So now we have all started using an open source screen reader called NVDA, uh, Non-Visual Desktop Access, where we can access uh, all applications, we can use all applications and everything uh, with this um, screen reader. And it's easily available on the nvaccess.org website and it's free of charge. And we can uh, download this and we can keep updating it and uh, we don't have to pay for it. So any blind person in any part of the world can uh, use a screen reader without any payment. We also have inbuilt softwares in Android as well as iOS, iPhones. Uh, in iPhones, it's called VoiceOver. It's um, by Apple itself. 
Apple normally uh, has inbuilt uh, software and Apple is really comparatively very, very, very accessible. Um, in Android phones, we have TalkBack, which is also inbuilt in the phone. Uh, you go to your settings and there is an option called accessibility. In some phones, you have to go to additional settings and then you find the accessibility option where you find TalkBack. And there are also magnification options where people with low vision can read uh, the text in larger fonts. In in the computers, uh, there are also magnification options in NVDA and in JAWS, and there's also a screen reader called Magic as well. There are reading softwares called KNFP Reader and At Voice Allowed Reader and Kurzweil Educational Systems and Google PDF Viewer. Yeah, there are many, many other uh, applications. There's Lazarello GPS for the Blind Global positioning system, navigation apps. There is uh, Uber is now quite accessible. Uh, there are many banking applications which are accessible. There's an application called Be My Eyes where we have volunteers at the tips of our fingers. So we just open the application and uh, we can uh, we have an available volunteer and we can ask the volunteer to give us assistance in terms of where is my cooker or where is the thread I dropped or um, and we have to point our camera to that. So there are many such uh, applications uh, which help us in a lot of ways. There are talking my Microwaves. Uh, there are even talking weighing machines. So there are a lot of assistive technologies now in today's day and age uh, which can help us. There are liquid measuring machines too in certain parts of the world where we can measure the liquid uh, is poured. Sounds really like a lot, but what about the people? Is there a change? Do you realize society is gaining sensitivity and awareness towards all individuals with whatsoever abilities and disabilities they have? Well, I think that people with disabilities are gaining awareness because um, they are being trained not only by Jodhir Gamiya, but there are many organizations which have come up in the local and the national level which talk about rights. There are many, especially during this lockdown, there were many, many national level consultations about rights, about uh, rights-based movements, about uh, women empowerment of persons with disabilities. Many, many, many uh, workshops were taking place uh, around various topics relating to accessibility. There are many courses also online which uh, people with disabilities are taking. Uh, in fact, my first sensitization program was in 2012 um, where I went uh, along with a few participants and other people from Brave Without Borders to uh, the railway station where we blindfolded the railway employees and told them, okay, now you buy your own tickets, now you fill the forms, and now you run around like you make us run around. And uh, th that really created a change. And now, of course, the railway staff are more sensitive towards uh, people with disabilities. Uh, so whenever uh, we conduct some programs with the police or with the railways or with the banks or with government offices, we see a kind of change in their attitude towards people with disabilities. We also see a kind of awareness among the people with disabilities, especially with the advancement in uh, technology about their rights, because now all these rights-based documents are all available online. Of course, they are not available in all languages, but there are many people who are learning and reading and attending workshops and consultations, especially now with Zoom and Google Meet and Microsoft Teams etc. So yes, there is a transformation. But yes, our country, India, needs to still go a long way away. It's also because of the old customs and traditions and values and cultural taboos, which our older generation have to really, really overcome. They have to overcome a lot of taboos and a lot of traditions. And uh, there needs an attitudinal change. There are many barriers which need to change. And I guess that will only happen with time. But things have changed since I was small. Yes, things have really, really changed. Luckily, they are changing because, I mean, accessibility is also a human right. And speaking about rights, your events, your work in general, provides a platform for Jyoti Gamaya to spread awareness about the potential and rights of the blind and visually impaired. Can you briefly describe your path these last eight years? Um, I started in 2012 as a mobile blind school uh, where... Jodhir Gamea uh, was traveling to the homes of blind people. So we were not really active in uh, 
rights awareness during those times. But in 2015, after um, I started uh, my residential training center, the Jodhar Gamaya Foundation, I started learning about the rights of persons with disabilities. I started reading about their rights. I started attending national level consultations uh, with the National Center for Promotion of Employment of People with Disabilities. I started working with the Election Commission of India for accessible and inclusive elections, which is, of course, our right. I started learning about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and I, as I had gained a training with Women Institute in Leadership uh, at Mobility International USA, where their training was conducted in Sri Lanka in the year 2018. Um, I also was a Kantari participant and graduate in 2013. Uh, so um, the course itself taught us a lot about how to stand up for our rights and challenge the status quo and uh, not to be everybody's darling. So I learned and I did a lot of online research and I encouraged my students to protest. We protested uh, for the currency change in 2016. There was a whole uh, shuffle of the currency notes. The currency notes were changed and now we cannot identify currencies because they are all of different shapes and sizes and things like that. So we conducted some protests and we appealed to the government, to the state government and the central government. I conducted sensitization programs in banks for accessible ATM machines, accessible currency notes. Uh, there were many of my students who were denied bank accounts and uh, we conducted awareness sessions for them with the result Bank of India and uh, we provide circulars to our students on the basic laws and rights. We conduct special workshops for women about their rights so that uh, we can actually stand up for our rights and wherever I get a chance I promote accessibility and employability for people with visual impairment. Uh, speak with companies about making their websites accessible, how to use the web content accessibility guidelines, how to follow them and how to make softwares and applications and websites accessible. So um, this is um, the small thing that me and my students and our team at Jodhar Gamaya have been doing to promote accessibility and in inclusivity among blind people. Okay. Checking out all the things you are doing, watching your speeches, one really gets very motivated and realize, wow. This is a tough woman who knows what she wants and is going to go for it. What is your feeling? How is the resonance? And where are you standing right now? Where are you now and what's next? Well, uh, normally I would say, well, I'm not up to the mark yet. I still, I don't think that, okay, I'm an object of inspiration. But yes, I'm a tough woman. You're right. I do know what I want. I want empowerment and accessibility and inclusion for blind people. I don't want us to stand as objects of poverty. I want us to stand as assets to the world, assets to our families, to our community, to the place we live. I want to do whatever I can. I may not be able to conquer the whole world or change the entire 15 million blind people, but the handful of blind people that I change, I want to do it well. Even if you do a little, you should be able to do that well. And that is what I want to do. Earlier, I was like, oh, there's so much to be done. There's so much to be done. But now I feel that, yes, there is a lot to be done. But I can only do what I can do. And that I should do well. So, yes, I am trying to challenge the status quo on, on a lot of things. For instance, blind girls going and buying things from restaurants. It's not heard of here, especially where I live. People don't do it. But yes, I have done it. And a few of my blind friends um, have done it too. In fact, I still remember the first time I went to a tea shop with, with was Anya Fafenseler, a blind lady from Germany, also a Kantari graduate and someone who has accomplished great things. And she actually took me to a tea shop in my own hometown here in Kerala. And I was like, could you do that? Blind ladies don't really do it. But I learned something then. I learned that we have to challenge the status quo because unless we do, no one will. So I still need to go a long, long way there. I need to really challenge a lot of things in the status quo. And sometimes we cannot do that due to family bondages, due to family limitations. Even I sometimes find myself trailing behind uh, because of my family restrictions or my father or my guardians or someone or the other. But I'm trying to do what I can. I still have not reached my um, goal of reaching the sky. I'm still a long way away there. And I think, but I think I've made a difference since I started my journey. I think I'm not quite there, but in the middle. Great, Tiffany. It was really encouraging and uplifting talking to you. 
What a delight. I'm really curious to know about what's next and how your projects and ideas will develop. I'll certainly follow them. So have a great day. Thank you for your spontaneity and keep in touch. You'll find the stories of the Cantari alumni and the Giraffe Heroes, the stories of people sticking their necks out every Tuesday on Spotify, iTunes, our homepage and every other place where you get your podcast. And if you subscribe, you don't have to look out for us. We'll be coming to you. Another thing. If there is a friend, a family member, or someone you know who is doing a great work in the community, someone sticking her, his, its neck out, just nominate this person organization as a giraffe hero or tell us about them. Come and visit us at giraffe-heroes.eu. My guest next week is Cantari alumni Raja Rajendran. Raja founded the organization Global Network of Equality that provides education, healthcare, legal support and other services that are required to give opportunities to children whose parents are in jail. My name is Jan Piera Yardurañona and I hope you join us also on our social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. But more importantly, I hope you join us again next week. Stick Your Neck Out, the weekly podcast of the Giraffe Heroes Foundation.